Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Jerick Show. I am Javad Malik, as always, and alongside me, unfortunately, is Eric Crone. But next week, he is on his way to Black Hat, so uh, maybe it will only become The Javad Show. Welcome to The Jerick Show, featuring your hosts, Javad Malik and Eric Crone. Timely topics, poorly presented. Speaking of poorly presented, how are you, Eric? Doing pretty good, and you? And uh, let me tell you, there is not a chance in the world that I am not going to make it next week. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to do it. But I will end up being here regardless of what happens at DEF CON and or Black Hat. So, sorry, pal. Going to be here to help you out. So, you're flying Delta to get into a Delta hotspot? Yeah, um, the, the one thing I'm going to make really good and sure of is that my seat is not a something D. So I'm going to make sure I'm not like a trifecta of deltas there, like 26 <laughs> delta. No, we're going we're gonna to make sure of that. Um, in, in all seriousness, folks, if you're going to Black Hat or DEF CON, be careful. Um, know that they just released something there that uh, Clark County is going back to some mask mandates. Um, so dig them out if you're not using them already. And Let's all just be very careful because, uh, you know, as much as we're joking here real quick, uh, the Delta variant is is not a joke out there. It's spreading in increasingly rapidly. So let's be careful, but let's have fun over there at Black Hat and we'll, we'll figure something out. OK, that's about as serious as we want to get for one day. Yeah, yeah, um, before we get into our news, we do have a very, very special guest with us today. Let's all please uh, welcome. Put your hands together for the lovely, the amazing, the wonderful, the talented Anna Collard. Hello, Anna. The muted Anna. Hello. <laughs> All right. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the show. Um, I got to say, you know, uh, every time we talk to you, I, I just you're, you're so much fun. You, you've got so much energy, so much fun. Um, we just we just really enjoy it. Now, now, for those of you that don't know, she is a colleague of ours, um, but way over on yet another continent. We're like global now, Javad. We are. That? We are. We we hit we hit every we've hit every continent I think so far, but um but yes, where are you based out of? Uh, out of Cape Town, South Africa. South Africa, as always. Okay, we'll get on to <laughs> we'll get on to Anna in a bit. Um, but but let's let's get the to the timely topics first, and then we'll get to the the poorly presented. Poorly presented. <laughs> yes. Beautiful. So first off, majority of employees take cybersecurity shortcuts despite knowing risks. Um, this is a bit like uh, driver's speed despite knowing dangers or <laughs> youth pull handbrake turns despite knowing dangers. But uh, no, but this is actually uh, a genuine thing. This is uh, research from Psychotic and uh, heavily quoted in it is Joseph Carson, uh, a.k.a. Dave Lewis or Gattaca's stunt double, if you don't know who that is, uh, and them two are actually clones of Colin Farrell. It's a long story. I'll, I'll have to explain <laughs> it some other time, <laughs> but that's the truth. Anyway, Eric, what has what this uh, research um, revealed other than the bleeding obvious? You know, yeah, you know, for one thing, I, I do, I don't want to say take exception, but I guess I, I think the... Uh, the headline is a little misleading in the fact that they're saying despite knowing risks. And I only say that not because not because they don't technically know the risks, right? But he, here's what, I, what we find is that although they technically know the risk, they don't understand what it means to have that risk, you know? And, and so this is the argument we go into all the time where awareness doesn't mean that they care. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're making someone aware that there is a risk of doing this thing, but they don't really understand what that means. They go, oh, it's a risky behavior, but they don't understand the fallout from that. And so this is this is another one of those situations where we talk about all of the bad things that people do. But unfortunately, even though we say they know the risks, that's just my opinion. I don't think they understand the risks. Make sense? Yeah, well, you make about as much sense as you normally do, which is little. But I think that's a big assumption, and and the only reason I say that is even people, I've, uh, even in our peer group, people who work in cybersecurity, they do things, and they fully understand the risk, and they can tie it back. 
sometimes it's just inconvenient. I mean, why do you want to pull out your 2FA app, uh, log on through three different systems just to be able to share something when, hey, I can just use Dropbox or you know use my WhatsApp or something and get a file uh, really quickly. So I think convenience pay plays a big part in it. Um, uh, and a lot of that comes down to not having the right architecture or tools in place to enable people to make to make better better risk decisions. Yeah, there, there's definitely an area where we ask people to do more stuff to get the same result. And, you know, that's a hard thing to sell. If they don't understand why it really matters, that's a really hard thing to sell. I mean, I think of email where it's like, okay, back in the day, you had a username and a password. You type that in, boom, I have all my email. So now what do we do? Now we throw in multi-factor authentication. So now it's a username, password, pull out my phone, open up an app, get those numbers. Oh, crap, I didn't get it. Deal with the incredible stress of the thing flashing while the number's counting down as it's going to change, right? There is very little thing, very few things in the world that are more stressful than that last couple of seconds, right? Um, but now we're asking them to do this, and the results are going to be the same. You get your same email, right? So this is where I go into the understanding it. If they don't know why they're doing that and don't understand what it really means for them not to go through that step, then it's going to be harder to get them to to do that. And you're right. Then they start looking for the workarounds. Anna, would you like to add why Eric's wrong in his analysis? <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think you're both right diplomatically. Um, I think that there's this, uh, you know, Perry, he, he always likes to quote um, this, this behavior scientist. Um, uh, I forgot his name. No, but B this B very famous. BJ Fogg, that's it. And, and I think he said it that desired behavior is motivation times ability. And then there was another uh, behavior oh. scientist who said, well, yeah. times um so oh. motivation sorry am i it, still there yes yeah. you are yes we can still hear you okay okay um i just got some funny feedback so so desired behavior is motivation times ability and then that wasn't bj Fogg. that's somebody else added in minus barrier so we really have to make mm. it as easy as possible for people to do what we want them to do and um Actually, BJ Park has the prompts. Um, that's another an, a, another component in it. But yeah, I, I I know. Like I mean, even amongst my friends, you know, I had them, and I mean, I've been preaching to them for years, and they say, oh, you know, so what if somebody gets in my email account or my social media account? I don't care, you know. But that that talks to what Eric was saying. I don't think they really understand the full impact that could happen, you know, and then you try and explain it to them. And you, say, you, know, you know, like once they're in there, they can reset your other passwords and they can send out really bad stuff in your name and it's embarrassing. And they could also, you know, steal your money and then, like, oh, yeah, I don't think it will happen to me. And back, you know, it's so much, it's so much effort to have that 2FA or that multi-factor um, authentication and it's complicated. And um, so I think there is a, there's a real resistance to even wanting to understand what the impact could be. It's just for a lot of people, it's just too mere and too complicated. You know, the other thing that BJ Fogg <laughs> says that I really love that, that Perry's pointed out a number of times and, and Perry Carpenter is who we're talking about here. He is a brilliant, brilliant guy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but Perry, he, he brings up the BJ Fogg quote. I believe it was uh, um, people are lazy creatures of habit and social may not be in that order um, design. Uh, things to deal with that essentially that that's that's the the gist of it right and he's right we we are lazy and it goes back to my example if we don't have to jump through extra hoops we don't want to right so if we are adding mm -hmm. multi-factor authentication we have to think about that right we're creatures of habit once it becomes a habit then it's easier for us just to accept and do and that also drives into um, a, a culture shift, too, because as people come in, new people come in and they look around and they see people doing that habit, that habitual type action, they realize that that's the accepted action. And so then they just follow much easier into that. But, you know, we're also social. Um, you know, we we see the people around us and we react due to that, too. And those two tie together. But I think uh, there's there's a lot of cool stuff we can learn from those insights um, with BJ Fogg. Mm. I, I love how how you you're so good at quoting a scientist when it comes when it suits your need and like oh because BJ Fogg said so that's why I'm lazy otherwise I wouldn't be lazy. 
<laughs> leaning on science as always. <laughs> hey, you know, you can't knock the science, right? No. So well, it, interestingly enough, though, I think this story, I know we had this story and it feeds directly into another story about somebody who may have even known the risks yes. and yet uh, things went horribly wrong. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Jim Browning. And I I love his channel. He's he's great. Yeah, so many people are aware of uh, these scams that they phone you up and they claim to be from Microsoft or, uh, or the government or something like that. And they will say, hey, you've got a virus on your computer. Give me it. And basically they want access to your computer and then they go in and then they want payment and then all sorts of thing. And they scam many, many people, despicable human beings. And Jim Jim Browning, his channel, he does the 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 uh, he, he takes them down basically. So he 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 plays the reverse Uno card. He gets into their systems. He starts deleting their files. He exposes them. He does a bit of OSINT. He finds out who, who they are, where they are. Starts referring to them by their real name. And uh, yeah. some of them have started crying on the phone. The scammers have started crying on the phone, which is just great. But um, I think in a in a cruel twist of fate, uh, what happened, Eric? Yeah, so basically he got suckered by a tech support call, um, and it was YouTube. Yeah, I guess uh, you know they they somehow or another talked him into basically deleting his channel, uh, saying that they were going to restore it. I don't know if he was having some problems or 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 you know if they made it all up or what, but basically he deleted his own channel. And now he's having to work through them to get it back. But a scammer convinced him to do it. So, I mean, it, this is an example of, you know, he know he knew the risks and, and fell for it. But this is also an example of when we have users or we have people that fail and screw up and make a mistake when they're fishing. And, you know, there's still a lot of people that go, how could you have possibly done that? You know, we kind of look, I don't course i know you do javad but looking down on those people as if you know they've they've done something horribly wrong and dumb but this is an example of just how how effective these scams really are and we got to back away mm -hmm. from that we get we got to understand that when these things go wrong we we cannot be blaming the users for this stuff all the time because these folks are good at their trade and this sounds like a very targeted attack against Jim Browning himself, because he's obviously exposed so many of these scammers. <laughs> they probably waited for the opportunity and you know wanted to delete his his uh, YouTube account. So, um, so uh, I mean, what do you think, Anna? Have you ever been suckered by by a scam? I mean, you're you're an expert. You're one of the smartest people I know. Um, I surely know. <laughs> you sh surely you haven't been fooled by something like this. Only by our internal phishing guys, like our security guys. I fell for actually two. Uh, one was like a policy update that came from the guy who always sends all the policies. So I sort of, I'm like, oh God, another one. And I clicked on it on my phone. So I failed and then I had to do my own, had to take my own training. <laughs> and I'd leave the alone. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, so Jim Browning, that's not his real name, obviously, uh, because he's, you know, what, what he's been doing, even though it's against these scammers, is not really ethical. But I, I think he's really cool. I, I used some of the, the pictures and videos he's taken in some presentations. But this story actually reminds me of another story I just saw. Um, um, I don't know how to pronounce them, but some ransomware gang called Babook or Babook bubble something they've been taken for ransom by this guy who's posting um well homosexual it's, it's the pornography porn. yeah. the porn. in the like you know they like the ransomware forum and he's like you know he says he needs he wants five thousand dollars or something so that yeah. he'll stop doing that so i thought that was quite funny <laughs> Um, yeah, that's brilliant. He's like dumping all of this porn in there over and over <laughs> again in their in their <laughs> ransomware forums, and he's ransoming them for five grand to make it stop. And they can't seem to get yeah. him to stop. They, they can't they get rid of to him. Stop him. Yeah, it's lovely. It's brilliant, and I love it. You know, there's no honor among thieves for real. No, uh, but I thought I thought that was brilliant. That you know that that they're getting a taste of their own medicine. So I don't feel bad for those folks at all. It's a ransomware gang. Bring it on. You know. Um, but yeah, it, it's, 
you know, you talk about falling for uh, one of the fishes and, and this happened to me. I, I've used this example before, I think even on the show, but you know, I'd been here about uh, 60 days. So I was in my first 90 days, which means that I'm still subject to being thrown out at any given time. I used to, um, uh, I used to report directly to our CEO. And so I'd been doing some presentations. I was on the road all the time. And, you know, I, I do a lot of hacker conferences. And, and so I got a little I got a little heavy on the memes and the hacker conferences because that's always fun. Right. Know your audience. And uh, what what happened is uh, I'm at the airport getting ready to get on a plane. I have my phone. I get a, an email from him. It's actually a Google Calendar invite. It says it's from Stu. And it says, Eric, I need to talk to you about some things I've heard about your presentations. And I went, oh, crap. I was like, oop, he's seen some of the dog memes. Like, I'm going to get in trouble for this. And it was a Google invite for, you know, a couple days, uh, like next next week. And I hit accept on my phone and they rickrolled me. Um, and, and I fell for our own stuff. And, you know, it was an eye-opening moment for me, though, because I'm like, I just, here I am, the guy running around telling people how to to secure themselves from this stuff. And I fell for it in a big way. And so I started thinking about that. And at first I was kind of upset about it. I was like, oh, come on, they're using internal information. But when I looked at it out on LinkedIn, I had the talks I've been doing. The talks get posted. They could see what I was putting out there. It, it was actually all done with external public information. So it's amazing to me just how easy it is to fall for this stuff. And the more confident we are about it, I think the harder we fall for these things. I really do. That, that, that's amazing. And so there were no repercussions, even though it was within your first 60 days. Uh, I ended up having to take uh, training. Um, I don't think it was Anna's training. Though. I don't think I don't think we were uh, uh, we were quite with popcorn yet. But um, you know, I had to redo the training and all that. But I use it as an example of that because it, it truly and really is one of those things that we get so comfortable sometimes and so caught up in our own skills that we forget that we are just as susceptible. You, but you've never fallen for anything, have you? No, I haven't. And you know, they say ignorance is bliss. And I hope to be one day as blissful as you, Eric, because but you, you started off by saying you used to report to the CEO. And now you what three, four layers between you and the CEO. In another five years, you'll be you'll be just like reporting to the cleaning lady or something and uh, or, or the security guard at the door. So um but if if you're still happy, then all the more power to you. That that that's all I say on that. I'm okay with that. You know, I got to tell you, um, there are people, you know, that that in this world that want to be someone else's boss for no other reason than having the title. I don't, I don't know who I could be speaking about. Yeah. Here, but, uh, so, so, so you know what? I've not fallen for an internal phishing exercise, and there's a secret to that. So we have a fish alert button here at Know Before on installed, and a, just a black browser plugin. So if you suspect something of being a phishing email, you click it. And it goes through to the security team and then they'll assess it they do a triage they'll pull out forensics whatever they need to do and then if it's uh, a phishing email they'll they'll quarantine it they'll send you a thank you note and if it's clean they'll just pop it back in and say well thank you for reporting it but it wasn't anything dodgy so i just end up hitting the fish alert button on every single email that i receive and uh, now the, the the security team i like my pas they will take all my emails, they'll sort them out nicely, and they'll start, you know, sorting them back into my inbox in an orderly manner. So yeah, don't do this at home, folks. Do not do this to your, your security folks. It is absolutely the wrong angle to take on this, really. <laughs> don't hate the player. Don't hate the player. <laughs> anyway, sp speaking of uh, <laughs> uh, me, um, th this really interested me because my first job, so I, I done a work placement doing my degree for one year, and that was with NatWest Bank. And uh, so I saw this and said, oh, there's a dispute between NatWest and a, and a data breach whistleblower. I thought, what data breach could have been? And this is really weird because it wasn't a data breach in the way you might think it was a data breach. This was someone who had a remote working agreement in place with their boss and this this employee worked at a branch. So they were working from home and they were getting posted or they were collecting from the branch once a week, all these mortgage applications and uh, people submitting all the information along with those applications. So sometimes there's a copy of their passport, driving license, uh, uh, earnings, all that kind of stuff. So um, 
this ran for about three years and um, they ended up with about 1600 paper files containing confidential customer information and they were like well that's a lot of information i have at my house what's the process of returning it and apparently the bank could not figure out a, a way that they could return it properly and I, I shared this with some colleagues of mine who who we worked at NatWest at the same time together, and they're like, "This is pretty much on brand for for NatWest. They, this is like <laughs> uh, not not to throw anyone under the bus, but they're a big bank; they they can handle it. Um, they um, and and so they actually uh, the employee raised the issue with the Information Commissioner's Office to say this is a data breach, and they they want to return it, and the ICA was like, well. Um, we only deal with electronic records, so this isn't covered in the scope. So you're on your own. Uh, ten years to do that, Jabbar. That kills me on this. They finally, finally decided after ten years, huh? Maybe this isn't our jurisdiction after all. <laughs> maybe, maybe there was some legislation going through that was put it out of their jurisdiction, so they were waiting for it to go through before they responded. Kick the can down the road a little longer, eventually. But how crazy is this? The guy's got a uh, this person has a whole bunch of paperwork sitting at home that they want to return to the bank. They don't want it. Yeah, and yet yeah. they can't get rid of it. So what? You know, can they not destroy it? Can they? I mean, it's just crazy that they are stuck with this for so long. And it, it ties back to me here, my local HOA. Uh, homeowners association for those of you that don't know you know the place where everybody goes to complain about everybody else um but basically our association that runs all of this stuff here um not too long ago we had a big shake up on the board well one of the board members had about a decade of paperwork in his garage at his home related to all of the people's stuff here and this is stuff where people are are filing medical hardships you know i can't mow my lawn because i have this or that or whatever you know temporary long term whatever it doesn't really matter but there was a lot of information in there that that probably shouldn't be sitting in someone's personal garage with the door open for how long you know and they couldn't figure out what to do with it they didn't know what they could delete they didn't know what they couldn't what you know how to deal with all of this paper stuff. And this was an ongoing thing. And, and I personally did raise the, the flag on this a little bit and say, hey, you guys got to do something with this. We can't just leave stuff like this laying around. There's actually <laughs> sensitive information. Um, but they weren't sure what to do with it. And it, it brings up something in my mind, which is this is caused by a failure to plan in the future about how you're going to deal with this. They came up with this great idea of work from home and here's how we're going to get you the paperwork, but nobody ever thought, how are we going to deal with it once you have it? And we see that over and over again in lots of things uh, in our world, but this is just another example that's that's kind of come out in a rather comical way. Yeah, Jeff Goldblum from Jurassic Park comes to mind. You were so obsessed with it, whether you could, you didn't stop to think whether you should. Uh, but 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 I, I suppose you, you raise a really interesting point, Anna. Do you think that as businesses reopen and people start going back to the office, we're going to see similar types of issues where, for a year, year and a half, people have been working from home. They might have been uh, using their personal devices. They might have been, mm. you know, using their work machine for personal use. Um, maybe devices haven't been updated for a long time. Maybe they've been printing out stuff at home. Do do you think that's yeah. going to be a problem? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, also to cut them some slack, maybe that, uh, you know, we didn't have enough time to figure out all the processes. You know, we had like, mm -hmm. in some instances, two, three days to get thousands of employees set up at, at you know, to work from home because of those lockdown, um, you know, legislations or, or regulations coming in so quickly. Um, so I think that we'll see more of that, that there are just cases or processes that haven't really been thought through. Um, what I find funny about this, it reminds me of, um, I used to be, I, I know, <laughs> back in the day, I used to be a PCI DSS auditor or QSA, and I helped some of our um, local retailers on their sort of PCI compliance thing and they had this thing that the that the acquiring banks you know who were sort of issuing penalties if the retailer wasn't compliant kept on sending them credit card holder information in unencrypted uh, spreadsheets 
So yeah, you know, so yeah, so yeah, I mean, this is like a few years ago, but you have these massive organizations like a big sort of legacy bank, and then they on the one hand side want to enforce the security um, you know, standard, but on the other hand, there's some somebody sitting somewhere that has to interact with the retailers and they're just happily sending <laughs> all this sort of really critical sensitive information in the worst possible way. So I think where there's people involved, you know, you'll you'll always find like processes that yeah that uh i wouldn't call yeah i'm looking for a diplomatically correct word but you know what i mean you know um so in this case what i find weird in this case is that the the ico just says it's not in scope i mean surely it is i mean whether it's on paper or electronic who cares it's it's sensitive or it's personal information um yeah. i thought that was a bit odd but Anyway, yeah, funny story. <laughs> it's an interesting story because there are cases. I mean, there's weird stuff like the person was let go for misconduct and and this, that, the other. I mean, it's it's a complicated thing. But, Javad, it made me think of something right now. And that is in this platform, we need to have an audio file with the circus music queued up. So you can just fire off. Dun, 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 dun. We, we see so many of these kinds of things like this. Um, I, I it only makes sense. Yeah, I don't have the music, but I do have this clown image here. Hold on. Let me just share it. <laughs> I just really don't care. <laughs> so, yeah. You're welcome. Anyway, Anna, down to your part of the world, uh, South Africa, uh, port yeah. operations halted and workers reportedly put on leave after major cyber attack. Um, that's, like, yeah. it's like a, that's a major cyber attack. Sounds like a villain from the 80s, but um, yes. go, go on. What was this one all about? So this is actually still ongoing. Um, it's, it's been keeping everybody sort of in suspense for the last week or so. Um, so Transnet is our national port and rail and transport authority. So it's quite a big critical infrastructure company and they um, control, you know, for example, the ships that come into the harbor and the containers and, and all of that, the systems that they use are used to coordinate that. And um, last week thursday or friday they've they've been hit um well allegedly or assuming it's a ransomware attack i'm 90 percent sort of 99 percent sure it's a ransomware attack however um so far transit haven't publicly confirmed that at all they said that they were under um there's a cyber attack and they had to um sort of um pull that force majeure well, we really pronounce it force majeure um incident um which is interesting because you can't do that if something is like a act of war or um, terrorism attack. And you have to remember that in South Africa about two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, we had really massive riots and quite a, a hectic sort of, um, not uh, fortunately not where I live in Cape Town, but in, in Durban and in Johannesburg, um, our ex-president was, was put into jail. Um, <clears throat> for contempt of court. Um, and then two, three days later, there was an organized, really politically organized um, looting and rioting attack that happened. Um, in fact, 40,000 shops have been looted, destroyed, burned down. It was, it was crazy. And so the cyber attack, like some of the, the other political parties are saying that this is maybe related to the insurgents. Um, so, you know, then, then another report came out actually, um, I'm on this on the CISO group, and one of the the CISOs on there is actually one of the security guys on there is actually from Transnet, but he's not allowed to share anything. He did, however, share another news article about the Chinese uh, that are busy being in, indicted in the US for some hacking that they've done a few years ago, stealing um, maritime uh, secrets out of South African companies. So there's all these like theories and stories going on, and. Uh, Transnet hasn't publicly confirmed yet. Um, I still think it's not, I don't think it's politically, um, I mean, I don't know, maybe it is, but I, I, I suspect to 90% sort of, you know, a probability that it's a ransomware attack. Um, in fact, the CrowdStrike, CrowdStrike guy said it's most likely linked to the Hello Kitty or Death Kitty ransomware gang. Um, somebody leaked the actual ransom note and it it looks similar to the ones that um they used in that sonic wall one and um um well you know 
uh, other attacks that they were known for. Um, so yeah, but they haven't, you know, they haven't publicly um, confirmed nor denied it. Uh, well, it's so, interesting. Yeah, we'll I think see. they said, yeah, at the top of this, it said they they're calling it an IT disruption, right? Yes. And and that's Look, a that's an that's an interesting way to put that. And and we all now I think look at when we see an IT disruption, we just automatically translate to, oh, ransomware attack. Right? I don't know, because it's so prevalent. But I mean, yeah. it had, it, it, I mean, they, they, you have to also give these guys kudos. Like I know that they've been working 20 to 22 hour days for like five days in a row and um, all hands on deck, like literally, uh, you know, doing whatever they can, whatever they could. And they took down a lot of the systems as a precautionary measure so um but they had to so so then you have like the harbor and the ports here which i mean cape town is a, or, or durban those are massive ports you know south africa is the at the at the bottom there and we you know it, it is it's a big sort of impact and they had to do all of that manually like reverting back to manual um well coordination of of getting these containers um into the port so it is a massive impact um it, you could actually you could call it a bit of a terrorism or, 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 you know, I mean, it is critical infrastructure that wasn't operating as it should. Um, but luckily, they, they got them back up. So it's running again. Um, whether, you know, um, yeah, whether it was that particular ransomware gang or not uh, remains to be seen. So this isn't the first time we've seen attacks on maritime stuff with ransomware. You know, Maersk, mm -hmm. uh, Maersk was, was taken down by it um, pretty significantly. Um, yeah. by a ransomware attack. And and my understanding is they got super lucky on that one and were able to recover fairly quickly because one of their domain controllers, I believe it was actually in South Africa, had been offline at the time um, <laughs> for some maintenance. And yeah. so when everything got killed and, and all of their Active Directory got destroyed, they were basically able to rebuild from that one machine which had been offline at the time. But you know, here in but, the U.S., there was a time where the, the Coast Guard was requiring things because they didn't want people to come in and connect to the networks because they yeah. thought the ships may be infected. I mean, this is serious stuff. And that was collateral damage, right? I think there was that whole, wasn't that that uh, WannaCry or Petya attack? So yeah, yeah, the was wasn't, yeah, they weren't even targeted mm. specifically. They just happened to be vulnerable to that Ukrainian tax system, whatever that uh, it was. But yeah, that was, I actually listened to one of their talks at a conference and it was incredible what they had to go through to um, you know, make things do manually. They had to go back to manual paper yeah. and, you know, how we used to do things. <laughs> yeah, and that's a big deal. If you've ever watched operations out there at some of these shipyards, it is amazing the amount of things that are rolling around and, you know, how quickly they unload some of these container ships and just the sheer volume of containers are pulling off of those. They're tracking them out throughout the area. You're just rambling now. So you're absolutely <laughs> right. There's a lot of stuff going on. We, we've just reached that point now where I've got to remind, uh, hold on, I've got to remind everyone, uh, subscribe to The Jarrett Show. JarrettShow.podbean.com is the site. You can find it in any of your, your favorite podcast apps. Um, uh, <laughs> for, or you can follow us on Twitter, for, um, uh, on YouTube, sorry. You can find The Jarrett Show on YouTube. Uh, there's at, at The Jarrett Show on Twitter. Or you can follow me personally. J4V4D is my one. You don't want to follow the other bald, fat American. Oh, anyway, that right that wraps up the section of our news that was uh timely topics poorly presented with slightly improvement on quality though this week i must add as it always is whenever we have a guest so anna collard you are now the focus of our discussion uh how, we want answers um <laughs> <laughs> popcorn training uh this is the company that you you founded uh, it's now a a no before company as it says on the website um so t tell us a bit about your journey uh where did anna come from and uh how, how did popcorn come into being um okay so originally i'm actually from germany um so i grew up there and uh, then in my early 20s, I moved to South Africa for an internship and uh, long story, but I ended up staying. And um, 
I think like as a as a student, I always loved, or even as a kid, I loved drawing cartoons. That was like my my thing. And I wanted to study art and my dad's like, no, there's no money in it. Um, and then I said, okay, can I do languages? Because I really enjoy languages. He's like, no, there's no money in it. So I ended up doing international economics, actually, where you combine economics, which I found very boring, but with uh, multiple languages. And you had to do internships abroad. That's how I ended up in South Africa in the first place. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, and then I, I, I was waitressing like any student would do. And um, then Siemens in Munich, they had like a, um, a program called the Siemens Student Program where you earned more than, than waitressing. So I entered that and they gave me the option to write my, um, I did like a BA equivalent, like my BA thesis or, you know, uh, sort of um, yeah, diploma work. I don't know what the German, it's, it was a German thing. Um, in cyber security or information security and it was called then and um that's how i got into it and and through that that piece of work i got a um i, I got a job in johannesburg um at like a service provider internet service provider they were looking for a security engineer i said i have no idea about engineering but here's my thesis and then i became the sort of interface between engineering and product management and the, the business unit so i i had to translate between the technical guys and the sales people, um, which I really enjoyed. And yeah, fast forward a couple of years along the line, I've, I've sort of, um, I don't know, I think probably because I, I didn't have a tech background, I always felt the imposter syndrome and I didn't feel good enough. So I did all the certifications on, you know, that you can get to sort of keep like learn more and get more sort of, um, I, I guess, officially qualified. Uh, to keep up with my my colleagues um and then i got married and on honeymoon i started drawing a a story uh, and i came up with these characters um really cheesy uh Frody Skimbeck and Robin Your Data, they work for money laundering. And they it was like this cartoon story that explained security principles in a fun way. Uh, while my husband was um, sailing, I was on the beach drawing this thing. And I took that then when I went back home to, to one of the customers I was based on site at, at the time, Old Mutual, they're like the biggest insurance company. And I just showed it to them as a, you know, sort of, hey, this is fun. And they're like, this is really good. You should do this. Um, and yeah, and then I found some animators who happened to work for like sort of they did actually Disney productions, but their company went bankrupt. And I met with them. I said, look, I don't have much money, but um, I need someone who can animate my cartoons. And that's how it started. And um, yeah, through that customer, I, I guess, who saw something in it um, and who was so supportive, they guided me. They said, OK, we don't just need these stories you have to like um, create a learning management system then I had to find a developer you know um, so it's sort of they I must say like you know um, they were really supportive and enabled me to start this little idea on the side which then became a business um, like a full-time business about a year and a half later um, I sold it to a lot of local South African customers, mainly through word of mouth. I mean, I had no money for marketing or any of that. Uh, we were squatting at the security conferences. I always squatted at somebody else's booth and I said, can I have some pop, I have a popcorn machine, you know, if we're handing out popcorn, it will attract people. And then I don't have to pay the actual conference fee. <laughs> um, and that's, it was really, I mean, yeah, we did everything on a shoestring. Um, you know, hired friends to do the voiceovers. And, um, but we got like within a relatively short time, we got into pretty much all of the banks locally, the big insurance companies, the big retailers, telecom. And I think that made Gartner, they recognized us. And then we managed to get onto Gartner's Magic Quadrant. Um, and that's how I met Perry, actually, Perry Carpenter. He was the analyst. And then a few years, Later, he left Gartner and joined Nobefore. And what was funny at that time is that um, a lot of the competitors were obviously quite upset with Perry because he had insight as a Gartner analyst into all of these companies. And I think um, 
fish me or, or co fans I can't remember like um one of them even wanted to sue Perry um but when he's when he told me I just you know in South Africa the security industry is really small and you always have these cases where somebody works for your customer one day tomorrow is a competitor and the next day he will work for you or something so you always have to be like nice to people because you know you just never know where you end up so I just said to Perry look I, I wish you all the best I don't have any issues with um with that choice and and i enjoyed working with him and i th yeah and then he a few months later called me up and said can we work together and that's i think how the whole acquisition um then came about um so thanks to perry <laughs> and yeah since then i'm we part of of no before and um i initially I, I was still sort of the managing director and having to grow the business into the africa region um I'm, I'm by nature a complete introvert. Um, I enjoy sitting in my little corner, have, not having to engage with too many people. So that growing a business is not my that was not my natural thing. Um, so I very happily um, handed that over, and I joined the evangelist team. And I couldn't be happier. You know, I get my laughs in every day when I listen to Gerard and Eric um, when you guys. <laughs> Venter with each other and rip each other off at the stand-ups. And it's and it's interesting work, you know. I get to like spend time reading the news and researching and doing stuff that I actually really enjoy. And I don't have to manage a sales team or something like that. Not awesome. that that's you know, that's that is great, but it's not not for me. So, yeah, you know, it, it's funny because win. yeah, this what we do, what Javad and I do with our banter back and forth, this isn't for the show. This is us. I mean, this <laughs> is really us. We do this constantly 24 <laughs> 7 every time we talk to each other um this is just this is how we are and you know we we do have a lot of fun let me tell you something that i think is fascinating about your story and this is the part that stands out to me more than just about anything else and that is you took something that somebody said oh that's pretty good you should do something with that and you did something with that so how many people in this world have somebody that says, wow, that's really good. You should do something with that. And we go, no, 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 no. And and we never take that step to actually do something with it. And look, look what's happened from that, taking that extra step. And I think that's a lesson that so many of us mm. could learn from. Mm. You know, there's so many great ideas <laughs> that are left on a napkin at a coffee shop that never go anywhere because people are afraid to take that step and actually go out there. Cause there's, there's a risk. I know there was a risk for you when you did that, you say you're an introvert and now you're going to take your idea and you're going to propose it to other people. Right. And that's gotta be scary. That's gotta really make you kind of question things and, and self doubt and all that as you're waiting to, to show your stuff to the, the shark tank, uh, you know, group that's around you, whatever, when you're doing that. And that's a very vulnerable place to be. So I, I got to say kudos for doing that, but, we can all learn a lesson from that. Hey, this is a great idea that I'm going to do nothing with and then flipping around and doing something with it. So kudos on that, Anna. Yeah. yeah thanks, Eric. <laughs> yeah. What what really stood out for me is that you, you, you done the initial designs while on your honeymoon and, uh, <laughs> and, and how your husband just left you say, I'm going sailing. You sit on the beach, dear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but maybe he knew you so well he knew that's what he needed to do for you to come up with this uh, brilliant idea so maybe he's he's the wisest of us all so um <laughs> well the other thing Jawad, when we talk to folks in south africa you you are not our first guest from south africa and i think it's amazing that the security community there is growing we had mark the african which i absolutely adore he was just awesome talk about a guy that's full of energy and i know you know him because yes, everybody yeah. there has got to know each other. What an incredible guy. But learned a lot about the fact that, you know, some people, we, we don't always understand that, that you know, South Africa, there's yeah. a lot of stuff going on there, even in the tech side. But you all know each other, but there's quite a bit happening there. And that's that's really exciting and amazing to me. And I got to tell you, I mean, having folks like you and, and like Mark on here, it's fantastic to see that um, because... Y'all just seem so nice, too. I just don't even know. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so one thing, uh, just going a bit serious again, like uh, to, to Eric's earlier point about how you, you did take that step. And I remember years ago reading a book called The Beer Mat Entrepreneur. 
Um, it is the same thing. People write ideas on the back of beer mats or napkins, and then it just sits there. And then they see something on TV and say, I had that idea three years ago. Yeah. Well, you didn't do anything about it. So I, I suppose what what advice would you have? I mean, there's so many people. I mean, you go on Twitter and everyone in security is talking about, well, you're approaching this problem wrong. If you just done this, then it would solve it. And, and they have ideas. Some of them have good, even technical solutions or what have you. Um, what what advice would you give to someone looking to try and uh, maybe go off on their own and, and build something for themselves? I think the, the, the biggest advantage that I had was that I had this network of contacts already that I built through the, because I worked as a security, you know, consultant. I, I did have sort of personal connections to a lot of the CISOs and the bigger organizations. And I just called them up like you would call up a friend and say, look, I have this idea. What do you think? And really use their input um, to sort of, uh, you know, design the product. Because what I had originally in mind was not what came out at the end, because I really listened to what they had to say. And you build your, you go to market or to your, you know, prospective customers with like a minimum viable product. In my case, it wasn't even that. It was just a drawing. Um, and then you let them guide you to what they need. And then you're building it with them, for them. And I think that's that was the advantage that I had. I mean, I I, I remember sitting in, in a conference room with two of our customers that are actually competitors, two insurance companies. And we chatted about, it was like BYOD or some mobile policy back in the day that they needed some awareness for. And um, you know, like we just all work together. And I, I think that's also something that South Africans are maybe known for is that in the security industry anyways, we do work together really well. And we have lots of subgroups and WhatsApp groups and, you know, like people share and, and help each other, um, it, it, like, you know, um, in most cases. And that, that was my um, advantage. And I would always tell anyone um, who spends effort in creating a product unless they have real market feedback and real feedback from the customer it's it's really a waste of time because you don't know until you're actually sitting on the ground with your client um and in fact up until last year still i, I was still sold um in fact, even this year, I think the contract officially, um, I'm sold uh, one one day a week. I'm actually on site as a customer running their awareness campaigns. I'm their security awareness person because that gives me that on the ground, yeah. you know, like an understanding what works, what doesn't work. And it's quite a large, complex organization. So um, you, re you really get the, the insight. And a lot of our, our products were developed for them, you know, they said, oh, and our directors never do this e-learning. What can we do? I need to send them something on WhatsApp. And we came up with these micro modules like seven years ago, you know, now everybody does it. But that was how we um, sort of, I think that that close relationship with your customers, that's absolutely key and not wasting money um, and precious sort of resources on stupid things like my logo and um, yeah. okay, not nowadays nobody needs business cards, but that's all secondary. Like you go to your customer with a piece of paper or your your beer mat and see what they say, and then take it forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I wish we could sell um, Eric for a few days a week as well, maybe to a farm or something. <laughs> like it'll be more useful. But but I think what what what's really interesting is your your whole when when I try to unpick what the value that you you bring a lot of it is based around communication like so so your your education was there like you said in your first job you were the interface between the techs and the and the sales groups uh, and even popcorn it, it's about communication it's about how do you get a, a sometimes complex mm. technical security message and and not just deliver it to people but deliver it in a way that's a engaging so it's memorable uh, and um and 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 i think it's one of the the most underdeveloped uh, skills in the security uh, space. Um, what do you think that people could do better uh, overall uh, who, who aren't maybe communications professionals, who might not be a security awareness lead, they, they won't ro roll out a program, but even if it's like your, your, your uh, pen tester or someone working in a SOC or, or, or a risk manager or so something like that, uh, 
what what do you think they can they're missing out on when it comes to communication and and getting that security message like conveyed in a in a understandable manner mm, i think i think that empathy is a really important aspect like put yourself in the shoes of that whoever it is that you're talking to if it's uh, an executive you know then have empathy with the fact that that person has no time and no real interest for the details so you need to go there with like succinct facts you know that's the message or if you then meet like a I don't know a receptionist or someone you know have empathy with the fact that she did not uh, sorry he or she did not um he she or whatever <laughs> <laughs> so to be so careful nowadays um, that um, that they don't have that technical background and maybe also not the interest. So always try and make things um, not being not ever being sort of um, you know like looking down at people at all, but just trying to understand it as if you were to explain it to a child or your grandmother. You know, um, I, I think that's. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it is having empathy. Yep. I have a lot of empathy for Eric. It doesn't help me in my communication <laughs> with him. That's terrible. That's you break my heart here, man. Break, <laughs> I put myself out here every week and they, you just stomp all over my heart. Yes. Now, I, I think that's cool. You know, Anna, the communication is so often the key. And we talk about this all the time when it comes to trying to get, like Javad said, technical ideas across to non-technical audiences not only is it a problem going down to the users but also up to the leadership you know so often mm -hmm. we, we don't communicate well with the c-suite um we know what we want to say we get frustrated because again they don't see the risk let's tie it back to an earlier uh, deal but it's because we're not putting the risk in things that they can understand so I think that's brilliant. I think that's one of the things with like popcorn that that you've done extremely well. And I love your content. And it's also another <laughs> thing um, that that comes across when it when it comes to trying to do this training. And I'm not trying to get all corporate here, but the difference between organizations and the type of training that they're going to react to is huge, um, especially when it comes to being in different areas uh, of the globe, you know, localization mm. as opposed to just translation is a huge, huge issue. And, yeah. and I think you've grabbed that and you've done an amazing job down there, but it even works in the other areas as well. And, and I just, I can't say enough about how fantastic I think you did with that. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I, I think the other thing I just um, was thinking about it as you were, were speaking is that, um, you know, we, we built a lot of the concepts on stories and using um, analogies or metaphors where possible. So really, um, you know, making sure that you use human elements, you know, like we all remember a story much easier than facts, you know, um, even these, these memory um, specialists, you know, they can remember a whole deck of cards. They actually create a story in their brain because our brains are just wired that way that we can remember stories and characters and uh, and I mean Javad I think you use that also really well in your articles or your blogs um you use um, analogies you know that's also great to just convey something and something that we can picture you know uh, ransomware doesn't for someone who's non-technical they're like oh what is this but if you then try and create a picture around it and you say hey there's a ransom note you know like these things in the 80s with yeah. the with the <laughs> cutout yeah. um yeah. newspaper and these bad guys they steal the data and on, you know um and then then they're like oh okay you know then they see it and it's important to visualize concepts um <clears throat> and no, yeah that's th right yeah yeah because like when, when you tell a story your brain actually puts you in the into the story and that's how yeah. you get emotionally invested into it and that's why you care so much as to what happens next why yes. why the the girl didn't end up with so and so that she married someone else and you know what all that kind of stuff well, so this so is, storytelling last, is the whole reason that that our colleague um uh, Roger's wife likes my presentations more than his right he even put it in his book in his forward so. <laughs> i'm just going to throw it out there that it works well <laughs> it's just, just like you 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 know it's, it's just like you know random wins in in life you know it's like on linkedin oh, i i love to see your resume so what what skills you have? well my colleague's wife says that i'm a better storyteller than he is 
but it is so a big great. deal. I mean, Roger is a big deal, right? So yeah, it is yeah. actually. Yeah, I, I, I never admit that publicly, but go on. <laughs> uh, anyway, Anna, what is next for you? You've achieved so much. Uh, it, it's a wonderful thing you've, you've done. I, I'm not saying I want you to move on, but what, what do you see the future? What, what lies with that? And um, uh, professionally, personally even, um, or are you just really, really content with what, what you have right now? Um, uh, look, at the moment, um, I am in a sort of phase where I'm, I'm just comfortable. I must, I must admit, I enjoy working with you guys and the, the PR team. I really have fun. Um, I do like the fact that we have some freedom in using our resources also to do good. You know, like we, we can actually use PR as an excuse to do something that's meaningful. Uh, not an excuse. I mean, it's it's some you know it is creating good PR, so it is positive, and I, I like that because I think that we actually have a huge opportunity, particularly in Africa, to do more skills development and sort of um, you know get more youngsters and uh, you know young women as well attracted to join the the, the cybersecurity industry, and um, yeah, and it, it, I love the fact that um, with this current job that that I can actually do that and spend some time on that. So I enjoy that. Um, so I don't really have any massive plans. Um, I do love yoga, like uh, I told you, Jawad. So I'm, I want to do a yeah. kids yoga teacher course next. Um, not necessarily to make money with it because I don't think you, there's too many yoga teachers in Cape Town. I mean, it, Cape Town is like a... You have to picture Cape Town is a bit like a, it's, a bit, it's a bit hippie-ish, you know. People love the mountain and the nature, and everybody does yoga. So there's a lot of that around, uh, which I love. Um, so that's like my goal. Um, my next short-term goal is to do the. If you can do some Kim adult Kim. stuff as well, because I, I I'm becoming a bit like Eric, and like I'm beginning to struggle <laughs> tying my own shoelaces. My flexibility is next to nothing. Um, yeah. At least I don't have like a, a, a four foot shoehorn like Eric does just to <laughs> just to get into that. Uh, Eric, Eric, what's next for you? Yeah. Um, no, you know what? This has actually been a great episode. It has indeed. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you so much, Anna. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, we should do this more often. It gives us an excuse to chat. Uh, thanks for sharing. Thanks so much, uh, yeah. Thanks for sharing the news, your story. Uh, where can people find out more about you? Uh, or follow uh, on, out? Yeah, on LinkedIn, Anna Collard. And then I also have a Twitter account. I'm, I'm, I should be more active. And it's Anna Collard 3. There's already okay. a few so other. It's not Anna Collard 1. It's not Anna Collard 2. It's Anna Collard <laughs> The third, so the third. Do, do, <laughs> accept no imitations, folks. Uh, you've been watching the jet or listening to the Jerick show, and we will see you next week again. Stay secure, my friends. <laughs>